Hamlin Towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Visa, deep and wide, washes its walls on the southern side, a pleasanter spot you never spied. But when begins my ditty almost 500 years ago to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin, twas a pity. Rats. They fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses out of the vats and licked the soup from the cook's own ladle. Split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, they cried. Our mares are noddy. As for the corporation, shocking to think we buy gowns lined with ermine for dolts that can't and won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. Rouse up, sirs. Give your brains a racking to find the remedy we are lacking. Sure as fate, we'll send you packing. At this, the mayor and corporation quaked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length the mayor broke silence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I've scratched it so, but all in vain. Just as he said this, what should happen at the chamber door but a gentle tap? Bless us, cried the mayor. What's that? Only the scraping of shoes on a mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pitter-pat. Come in, the mayor cried, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest fellow. His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes each like a pin, and light loose hair, yet swarthy skin, lips where smiles went out and in. He advanced to the council chamber and, please, your honour, he said, I'm able, by means of a secret charm, to draw all creatures living beneath the sun that creep or swim or fly or run after me as you never saw, and I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm. The mole, the toad, the old, the newt, the viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I can rive your town of rats, will you give me a thousand guilders? One thousand guilders? Fifty thousand was the exclamation of the astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uppered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses the rats came tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, grey rats, tawny rats, grave old prodders, gay and friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the piper for their lives, until they came to the river Visa, wherein all perished, save one, who, stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry to Ratland home his commentary. Which was, at the first shrill note of the pipe, I heard the sound as of scraping tripe and putting apples wondrous ripe into a side of presage gripe, and a moving away of pickled up boards and a leaving a jar of conserved cupboards, and the drawing the corks of train oil flasks and a breaking the hoops, butter casps, and it seems as if a voice cried out, O oh, rats rejoice. 
Munch on, crunch on, take your lunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, luncheon. And just as a bulky sugar punch and already staved like a great sun shone glorious, scarce an inch before me. Just as I thought he said, come bore me, I found the visa rolling o'er me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ringing the bells till they rocked the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, and get long poles. Block out the nests, block up the holes. Consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rat. Suddenly, up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace with a first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders? The mayor looked blue. So did the corporation, too, to pay this sum to a wandering fellow with a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Beside, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink. Our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink. What's dead can't come to life, I think. A thousand guilders come. Take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait. I've promised to visit by dinner time back dat, and accept the prime of the head cook's pottage, all he's rich in. For having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. People who put me in a passion may find me piped to another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook being treated worse than a cook? You threaten this fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips laid his long pipe of smooth street cane. And there was a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling and pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes chattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering, like fowls in a farmyard where barley is scattering. Out came all the children running, all the little boys and girls with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls and sparkling eyes, teeth like pearls. Tripping and skipping ran merrily after the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood as if they were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by, could only follow with the eye a joyous crowd at the piper's back. And how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched council's bosoms beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the visa rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, and Koppelberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed. Great was the joy in every breast. He never can cross the mighty top. He's forced to let the piping stop, and we shall see our children stop. When those they reached the mountain side, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern were suddenly hollowed, and the piper advanced, and the children followed. But one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years, if you would blame his sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see. The piper promised a joyous land, just at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew and flowers put forth a fairer hue and everything was strange and new. The sparrows were brighter than peacocks here. Their dogs outran our fallow deer and honeybees had lost their sting and horses were born with eagles' wings. And just as I became assured my lame foot would be speedily cured, the music stopped and I stood still and found myself outside the hill. Alas, alas for Hamlin, the mare sent east, west, north and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever it was man's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart, content if he'd only return the way he went, bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was a lost endeavour and piper and dancers were gone forever, they made a decree that lawyers never should think their records duly dated if, after the day of the month and the year, these words did not as well appear. And so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376. And the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they called it the Pied Piper's Street, where anyone playing on pipe or tabor was sure for the future to lose his labour, nor suffered they hostelry nor tavern to shock with mirth a street so solemn. 
But opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and in the church window painted the same, to make the world acquainted of how their children were stolen away. And there it stands to this very day. So, Willie, let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men, especially pipers. And whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice, if we've promised them all, let us keep our promise. It was the Goths and Huns who drove the Venetians across the sea, but unlike today's invaders, they did not follow. By sea is truly the only way to approach Venice. Established on the islands, the new Venetians became great traders. Old warehouses on the waterfront bear witness to their salt trade. Venice, as an independent state, had an elected leader, the most serene prince, the Doge of Venice, although he did not rule. The great council, composed of all the noblemen over 25, ruled the city and the Venetian Empire from the Doge's palace. The council elected ten high officers of state who had the power to sentence offenders to the torture chamber. The journey from the palace to the prison by way of the so-called Bridge of Sighs. Casanova, found guilty of acts against religion, sentenced to five years imprisonment, escaped over the roof after two years. The large courtyard of the palace never received its officers by carriage.